Hello, my friends, hello, and welcome once again to Stately Fawn Manor. And it's Wednesday, which means it's Epic Comic Book Wednesday. Every Wednesday, I'll talk about a certain comic book graphic novel or comic book subject. Steve Donahue on his channel will talk about that same graphic novel, comic book, or comic book subject. It is our world's finest team up that we do once a week. And this week, we're going to be talking about one of the most groundbreaking and interesting runs in the history of comic books, which would be Alan Moore's time writing The Swamp Thing. Alan Moore started writing The Swamp Thing in 1984. He got help on the artwork from Steve Narbissette and John Totalbin, as well as some others. The artwork was consistently great on the saga of The Swamp Thing, and it was really good at the time that Alan Moore was writing this book. And Alan Moore did some really interesting things with this character. Now, the Swamp Thing had been creeping around DC Comics for a while at this point. Both DC Comics and Marvel Comics had their own swamp monsters. Marvel Comics had the Man Thing, and DC had Swamp Thing. I always felt that Swamp Thing was much more interesting as a character. He was originally created by Len Wein and Bernie Wrightson, and you could find all of those original stories in this big guy. This is the Bronze Age Swamp Thing Omnibus, which I was very happy and somewhat surprised that DC Comics printed. This omnibus has every issue of the Swamp Thing up until the time when uh, Alan Moore took over the book. And Bernie Wrightson's artwork on this book is just fantastic. Bernie Wrightson, probably the greatest horror artist of all time. And uh, Len, Len Wein could write a comic book. So it was, it was really interesting. There's the cover of the very first issue of The Swamp Thing. So The Swamp Thing lasted a while and then it was canceled. But The Swamp Thing was brought back basically because there was a Swamp Thing movie that came out. Not a very good movie. But there was a new series of comic books that came out called The Saga of the Swamp Thing. And so that was the second series of Swamp Thing stories, which continued Alec Holland's stories from the original. Alec Holland, who was a scientist who was developing a formula that can grow plants really big. And he got through, through a set of criminal horrific circumstances. There was an explosion. He ran out and was covered in the chemicals and dove into the swamp because he was doing all this stuff in the swamp with his experiments and became the Swamp Thing. And part of the Swamp Thing was Alec Holland trying to regain his humanity, wandering the earth and having various adventures, fight, finding strange creatures to fight, and trying to regain his humanity. That was part of the comic. And it was an odd comic because it was a horror comic. It wasn't a superhero comic, but it was the continuing adventures of a monster. So it was interesting and it was usually really entertaining and I really liked it. Swamp Thing was one of my favorites, always has been, because I love monsters. And this is a really interesting monster, the Swamp Thing was. But the quality of the book, it must be admit, admitted, really went up and down. The artwork was usually pretty good on Swamp Thing, but the stories, uh, they, can, they could be all over the place. Swamp Thing, unfortunately, is one of those characters that was retconned frequently. So Alec Holland's story could be a little confusing <laughs> because the story changed every once in a while. But the quality really went up when Alan Moore took over as writer. And all of those stories are collected, well, they're collected in a series of hardcover and softcover trade paperbacks. And I have them in the big monstrous absolute editions. This is the first one. And you see this, is, this says Vertigo on it because Vertigo was the line that eventually took over Swamp Thing. But that has been changed and that changed into black label for some reason, which I don't really understand. But this is the second 
volume of Absolute Swamp Thing by Alan Moore, and the third volume. And the artwork on these volumes is just amazing, and they're huge. They're very big. So this is a beautiful way to experience the Swamp Thing. So let me take out one of these big books here. They're very nice. They've got kind of this weird felt cover. It's really cool. So Alan Moore's time on the Swamp Thing, it began, let's see if I could find his first issue here. His first issue was number 20, and this was called Loose Ends. Alan Moore's first issue, he's trying to tie up literally all the loose ends uh, that were left over from the former writer. And he did a really good job on it. This was a really well done comic book. The artwork was just beautiful and really beautifully done. And in this story, Swamp Thing is captured and the real story begins in issue 21. This is an issue called Anatomy Lesson. And I'm going to give some spoilers to this decades-old Swamp Thing comic book because it's kind of important to the character of the Swamp Thing and where he went from here. Alan Moore did something really, really interesting with this story. First of all, he brought the Floronic Man into, into the story. The Floronic Man, Woodrue, is a scientist who knows all about plants and basically is a plant. And he's brought in by this evil guy who has Swamp Thing to try to figure out what makes Swamp Thing tick. And they do find this out. And even worse, the Swamp Thing, who lives again, finds the file on him, and he learns what Swamp Thing really, really is. And the thing is, and this was an interesting choice that Alan Moore, Alan Moore made with the Swamp Thing. The whole thing with the Swamp Thing was that the Swamp Thing was always trying to regain his humanity. He fell into a swamp and transformed into a monster, and he's always kind of trying to find a way back to becoming human again. But here's the thing. According to this story, the Swamp Thing isn't Alec Holland. He never was Alec Holland. Basically, the chemicals that Alec Holland was covered with affected some plants in the swamp, and they did their best to copy Alan, Alec Holland and took his memories and his mind. But the Swamp Thing isn't Alec Holland. The Swamp Thing is something else. So he can't regain his humanity because in real life, he was never human, which upset the Swamp Thing. He was a little mad about that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he ended up killing that guy because, you know, he was kind of pissed. And so the story continues from there. Uh, we have a romance that happens with Abigail Arcane, the daughter of his one of his enemies from the previous run of Swamp Thing. But this the artwork in this is just beautiful. And I have to say, I, I'm really glad I have it in the Absolute Edition because it's oversized and it's just magnificent to look at. Now, there are a couple things about Alan Moore's run on Swamp Thing that I'm gonna talk about. Alan Moore made the Swamp Thing even more into a horror comic book. And he had a series of stories, and particularly the earlier stories that he did, were very much horror stories. And they were sophisticated horror stories. And they were mature horror stories, much more so than we ever expected from a Swamp Thing comic book, which had always been fun, but had never been written at this level. And this worked very well for the Swamp Thing. 
one of the things Alan Moore did, though, is that he had the Swamp Thing through this series of comics that he did kind of go to all the corners of the DC universe. The Swamp Thing himself became more and more powerful. He ended up being one of the most powerful characters in all of DC Comics. Swamp Thing is an incredibly powerful character because his body is something that he can just create from any old plant lying around. He can make multiple bodies. He can basically teleport from one place to another just by sending his mind out. And wherever his mind finds a plant, he can grow a body. It's, and he can make the, that body gigantic if he wants. So he became a very powerful, uh, very powerful being. And very often he would have run-ins with other characters from the DC universe. Usually when it was an otter character, like the demon, for example, Jack Kirby's demon, it worked really, really well. And he, he runs into some of the darker characters in the darker, in the darker corners of the DC universe. And that's always great. In fact, Constantine, looking just like Sting, shows up in the Swamp Thing. But there were other moments in the Swamp Thing uh, that were a little odd. And that is usually whenever you have traditional superheroes show up like Superman and the Justice League. The Justice League shows up fairly early in his run. And it's just a little strange. And it doesn't really work for me. And I think one of the reasons is... And I found this with Marvel Comics too. Whenever you have a horror comic book, even if it's a cheesy horror comic book, the minute you put superheroes in, it starts to get a little, it, it, it kind of throws you out of it somehow. Now the opposite usually works. Superhero comics work on a certain level. If you put monsters in a superhero comic, it doesn't matter. You put superheroes in a monster comic or a horror comic, suddenly it kind of makes it harder to accept. Especially the way Alan Moore did it, where you have a more realistic world and you have the superheroes, the Justice League, none of, none of whom call each other by their superhero names. They're always calling each other just by their names, like Hey Clark or whatever. And they're wearing their typical superhero costumes. And it's just odd. It just feels odd. With one exception, and that is when... Swamp Thing meets Batman. Batman works, probably because he's, for two reasons. One, he's a darker character, and he doesn't have superpowers. So he's not a traditional superhero, the way we think of superheroes being with superpowers and these weird abilities. Batman works fairly well in Swamp Thing, and he had been in Swamp Thing before, in the original run of Swamp Thing, and he comes back in this, as do many other characters in the Swamp Thing. But just to give you an idea of the quality of this thing, I mean, look at this. This is beautiful. This is just beautiful, beautiful work. And the writing was sophisticated. And like I said, when, when Swamp Thing runs into some of the stranger characters, like the Spectre, this book works really, really well. You know, when you have characters like that, characters from the weirder, weirder sections of DC Comics, and there's the demon making an appearance. That stuff works great. The covers were magnificent. Uh, just such a beautiful run. I'm actually going to, because I don't want this video to go on all day, like my comic book videos usually do, I'm going to skip to the last volume because there's a couple things I want to show you and talk about which kind of demonstrate what I'm talking about if I can find these particular issues. There's at one point where uh, Abigail Arcane and the Swamp Thing get into a relationship which freaks people out and Abigail is arrested and is imprisoned 
in Gotham City. So Swamp Thing, with his great powers, goes to war against the Batman. And you can see this fantastic cover, what Batman, poor Batman, what he's up against with the Swamp Thing. So the Swamp Thing is demanding the release of his wife and uh, the police refuse to do it. And the Swamp Thing goes to war with Gotham City and just makes, <laughs> makes everything overgrown and it, it, becomes, it becomes a tense standoff. The artwork is really good and try to move on to Batman here. So there's Batman, and this really works. Just Batman and Swamp Thing going head to head is fantastic, but right here is the power that I was talking about that this Swamp Thing in this version possesses. Uh, yeah, Batman's like, oh, okay, I'm in trouble when you have multiple Swamp Things coming at you after his flamethrower didn't work. And yeah, Swamp Thing basically just kicks the crap out of poor Batman. And some of the imagery is just beautiful. I mean, that is just awesome right there. So Batman works very well in Swamp Thing. But unfortunately, he did get Abby back, but then he was shot and destroyed, seemingly. And we get that just beautiful, beautiful shot. I mean, just look at that. That's just gorgeous. Batman looked great in this comic. So that worked really well. And then we have a period where Swamp Thing had to send his mind out into space because he was cut off from Earth. It all makes sense in the story. And he goes into outer space. And then we get to a part that didn't work so well for me. Because then we get Adam Strange, one of my very favorite characters. And Alan Moore decides to kind of make Adam Strange almost a comic character. A comedy character, I should say. He was always a comic character. But he kind of a figure of comedy. And it was almost offensive to an Adam Strange fan how he was portrayed. He was portrayed as kind of... Well, I mean, Adam Strange is really smart. His adventures are some of my favorite adventures in all of Silver Age comics. And Alan Moore kind of portrays him as kind of a horny idiot. Like, this part where he's fighting Swamp Thing, and he thinks that Swamp Thing is just yet another monster that he has to fight, and he's really frustrated because all he wants to do is go back and have sex with his girlfriend. And that's all he's thinking about. And I'm thinking... That's not, I mean, Adam, that's not him. And so I was a little annoyed at that. And, and you get some of that in Alan Moore, where you get these kind of versions of characters that just aren't the characters as you would, as you knew them. And it's certainly I felt that way with Adam Strange. He did, he did bring on an evil version of, the, of Hawkman and Hawkwoman. It's not the Hawkman and Hawkwoman that we know. It's an evil version. Two other cops from Thanagar. And that was actually pretty cool. But Adam Strange, I felt, he didn't come off particularly well in this story. Maybe I'm just sensitive. But I've noticed that... I've noticed that with some characters that... Alan Moore does. Sometimes he makes this stuff too mature for certain characters to really work. 
And I kind of felt like that with Adam Strange a little bit. I really felt like that in The Killing Joke, which is, which is a whole other thing. Which we will talk about someday, Steve and I. I am not a fan of The Killing Joke. Beautiful artwork aside, there are things about that book. And even Alan Moore has disowned it. So... Even he knew he went a little far in that. There is a Superman story at the end of this that, that fares a little better. Alan Moore has a better grasp of Superman, I guess, than he did Adam Strange. It was still a little, little odd, but it, it, was, it was certainly a lot better, I think. But overall, this series was a groundbreaking series. The artwork was beautiful. The stories were very interesting. And it is one of the high points of comics in the 1980s. One of the most important run of comic books. No matter what I might think of particular issues or the way he handled certain characters or how it just felt weird to have the Justice League in it at all or any of those characters in this comic. No matter what I might think of that, it remains one of the most important and influential comic books that has ever been done. And I guess I'll shut up now about Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. You can check it out for yourself. Like I said, it's available in all kinds of different ways. Trade paperback, hardcovers, these big monsters, digital, however you want to read it, you should read it. Because if you're interested in comic books at all, these are must-reads. Okay, my friends, I will catch you next time.